good afternoon. Um, since this was a Saturday, I had to bring my little one, who is a who evidently doesn't know that um, I direct the games and virtual environments lab. <laughs> So he's not entirely sure what I do as a, as a, as a professor. And um, I guess one of the neighbors recently told him that I'm a professor. So he's like, what does a professor do? <laughs> so I told him, I'll show you today. Um, but he's busy with his iPad, so we'll, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been directing the Games and Virtual Environments Lab at the University of Georgia for, um, I think it's about eight, eight nine years now. Uh, but I started my training in virtual reality back in 2006. So that was uh, way, way, way before, I guess, it became a thing. Um, and back in those days, our head-mounted displays cost about $50,000. And our cheaper version of the head-mounted displays were about $30,000. And so I was always terrified that I would break one of those and then never be able to graduate <laughs> because I had to pay it back. Um, but fast forward 10 years, and we're already at a point where these head-mounted displays cost maybe about $300 to about $500 each. And so you can see how much um, the technology has progressed and how accessible it's become. And um, I guess the, the interest rate in which people are considering virtual reality as a tool for communication has um, really kind of changed its tone um, in just the past few years. And so um, I wanted to kind of introduce a, a, a aspect that not a lot of people are studying with virtual environments or virtual reality. Um, I think a lot of the research on virtual reality tends to be focused on the engineering aspects, um, how to make the hardware more wearable, uh, better, I guess, um, latency, faster, um, clearer, and so a lot of the focus of the research on virtual reality tends to be focused on, on, on those aspects, um, whereas in social sciences, we're much more interested in, in the human aspect of things. So how do people change the way that they think and feel and behave as a result of these virtual experiences? And my research has really focused on um, how the exposure to these virtual experiences can impact um, not just your virtual experiences, but when you come out of the, of the virtual world into the physical world, and how does that change the way that you think and behave. So I'll cover a few of those um, studies that we've been conducting over the past seven, eight years um, at the Games and Virtual Environments Lab. So as you all know, virtual reality is uh, often described as such, right? Mediated reality where users can see, hear, and feel as if they're in the physical world. The idea of virtual reality has remained pretty much similar, I guess, um, ever since it was devised back, way back in the 50s. The idea is that you use digital technology to represent different sensory layers, and you layer the um, sensory information so that you envelope and surround the users with um, sight, right, with the five senses, sight, uh, hearing, tasting, smelling, and touching, right? And so the more layers you're able to provide to users, um, the more it tends to feel like reality. What's really interesting um, in, this, in this whole definition is that the human brain is actually pretty easy to trick. So when we try to surround um, the users with these sensory simulations, and this is uh, my old Stanford laboratory, um, and this here is the $50,000 head-mounted display, which is um, pretty bulky. And uh, you always had to kind of make sure that you had a hand in front of your head-mounted display so that it didn't flip forward, because it's so heavy in the front area. Um, and then we had um, cameras all around the room, and the camera system itself was about $30,000. And so it was really expensive and almost prohibitively expensive for anyone to consider this outside of a sophisticated laboratory. In any case, so I wanted to give you a quick example of how easy it is to trick the human brain by using these sensory inputs. Um, so I'm going to play a video clip. And as you are watching this, I'm going to ask you to think of a couple of different things. OK, so I'm going to play that clip again. As you are listening to what this clip is saying, you just heard a sound, I want you to think of the word brainstorm. Did 
Did you hear that? OK. So this time, we're going to watch the exact same clip, but I want you to think of the word green needle. <laughs> the exact same clip. How does that work? I didn't tell you any lies. There, were no, there was no magic tricks uh, involved in this. Exact same clip. But your brain is making you hear completely different things, right? And so you would think that it requires a lot of technical expertise to make people believe things that are true or not true, but that's often not the case. And so we'll cover a few of these um, examples to kind of maybe um, give you an idea as to how persuasion works. Uh, there we go. So my research tends to focus on three domains, um, largely. And I look at health behavior, environmental behavior, and consumer behavior, um, all within the umbrella of persuasion. So how do I get you to uh, uh, pick up recommended behaviors, uh, eat better, exercise more, be more environmentally conscious, and so on and so forth. But it all fall, falls under the same idea of persuasion, so getting you to pick up behaviors that are recommended or are beneficial for you. And in particular, I look at how behaviors in virtual worlds transfer into our real worlds and vice versa. So there's a sort of an interaction loop between what's virtual and physical. Um, so one of the most fundamental evidence-based tips that we know about designing in virtual worlds is that uh, behavioral realism tends to be the key element here, not form realism. So behavioral realism we refer to as how behaviorally realistic does it seem? Does it behave in the way that we expect something to behave? So if it's in human form, does it behave like a human being? If it's in animal form, does it behave like an animal? So there's a certain expectation that we have in terms of what we think something should behave like. And um, once that realism threshold is, is surpassed, then we tend to believe that it's real. Versus if it looks completely realistic, photorealistic, but does not behave the way that it should, then our perception of realism um, tends to not be as, as influential as it should be. So for instance, let's say that there's a dilemma, because all of these projects tend to have a certain cost attached to it. And so you have to decide um, from time to time, uh, do you want to make this avatar photorealistically true, vivid, um, but without tracking? Or do you go with a cartoonish looking avatar? It's not very photorealistic um, realism, but do you have behavioral tracking? And it's often the case that the latter tends to be more realistically or perceived as realistic by users than the former. So if you have photorealistic avatars that look amazingly human-like but don't really behave like a human being, people tend to think that this is better. And um, if you think of, let's say, like stick figures, like my kid is always drawing stick figures. I'm trying to tell him, well, you have to draw five fingers, and he's like, no, stick figures. <laughs> Even if a stick figure is not photorealistically real, if you get the stick figure to move in the behaviorally realistic ways, then people are able to follow along with a certain set of, of um, I guess, a perceived realism, as long as that stick figure starts behaving like a human being, right? And so um, designers often, when I work with a lot of my modelers, they tend to really focus on the photorealism of things, because I guess aesthetics, you're trying to make it look as pretty as possible. But oftentimes, it's OK to cut corners in how realistic it is. And a lot of the videos that I will show you about of our lab's uh, virtual experiences, you'll notice that's not very, I guess, top of the, uh, the state of the art um, graphics. But as long as you have the behavioral tracking and as long as they're behaving in a realistic fashion, then people are more than happy to fill in the gaps with their imagination. And so why does this happen? And even with the behavioral realism, it's OK to not to forego the really expensive 100-point mocap. Um, just the basic commercial level lighthouses that the HTC provides or Oculus Rift cameras are sufficient. They're more than um, enough to get people to believe 
a certain set of rules or believe that a, another human being is behind the avatar and so on and so forth. And um, this is because there's, this is a, uh, the model of social influence by Blaskovich. And if you look at this model, this is basically saying, let's say that you have an avatar with a really low agency, meaning that this avatar doesn't really seem like a human being, but like a stick figure, right? But as long as the behavioral realism is really high, then it surpasses this threshold of social influence. And social influence is when you're able to wield some sort of a social power, persuasion, um, get them to do things or like you. And so this is a, um, a, a form of social influence. And as long as, even if it's a stick figure and doesn't really look like a human being, if it starts behaving realistically, then you're able to pass this threshold of social influence. The opposite is also true. If let's say something looks really, really, really photorealistic, and this needs to be like completely, you have all the details, then you get, you get to have a little bit of forgiveness in um, the behavioral realism side. Now usually the best thing cost-wise is to hit kind of a middle ground where maybe it doesn't look completely realistic, but as long as you have some level of behavioral realism, you're still able to pass this threshold of social influence. And so although a lot of um, my modelers tend to really focus on how realistic things seem, as long as we hit this middle ground, we're still able to pass this threshold. Um, now tip number two and three are kind of bundled together in the next few sets of slides. Uh, but what we find is really uh, high impact is when you personalize this experience. And I'll show you some of the examples that we use. Um, and also consider VR's unique advantage. And so I always ask my graduate students to ask a few questions to themselves before they embark on a large project. So for um, the first question, why do you have to use virtual reality? Why is it that we're bothering to program these things, animate and model these different assets? Why are we bothering to do this and spend this time and money if you can do the exact same thing with, let's say, a pamphlet, a picture, a video, some traditional means. Um, because oftentimes for persuasion, novelty alone, and virtual reality is still a pretty relatively novel um, device, novelty alone really isn't sufficient for persuasion. So you have to have a really good answer to why are you using virtual reality. Is it providing some unique advantage that you can't get from other traditional resources? And um, how do I engage users and viewers? And number one is to really personalize the experience. And this is very different from customization. So when you customize something, you are, you're changing the settings to um, meet your preferences. So that's customization. Personalization is to tailor the message so that it's directly and um, it's directly about you and no one else but you. So personalization is different from customization. And you're integrating the user as a part of the message, and virtual reality allows us to do this relatively easily. Um, so I'll give you a few case studies in the uh, domain of health and environmental behavior. So in terms of psychological distance, there's this phrase we use, and it's called psychological distance of risk. And I don't know if you can read this caption here, but it says um, about smoking. I'm out in the fresh air and sunshine. My lungs are getting plenty of exercise. I'm consuming a leafy vegetable. This has to be good for me. And so this is uh, like my brother, who always tends to quit every month. He's like, oh, I quit this month. <laughs> and the next month, oh, I quit this month. Um, so evidently, we do, as a human being, have, we do a really good job of distancing distancing ourselves from risk, and it helps us sleep better at night. And we have several ways to do this. It's not just this uh, smoking behavior. It's, it's pretty prevalent. Um, one large challenge of communicating risk is the social gap. And a lot of the social science research shows that people tend to be unrealistically optimistic about their chances of survival. So for instance, let's say that I had all of you imagine that we're on an airplane together. We're flying out to a remote island because we want to go to the beach. And let's say that airplane crashed, and I asked you to estimate your likelihood of survival against other people's likelihood. Everyone here deep down inside, you want to believe that you're slightly, ever so slightly, much more likely to um, survive, right? And people feel the same way about getting cancer. 
If you got cancer, let's say that you were diagnosed with cancer, you want to believe that you have a slightly above average chance of survival versus the average Joe or the average Jane. And we see the same thing with the better than average perception. So if I asked all of you to line up, imagine yourselves lining up in a line in the order of attractiveness or in the order of intelligence, everyone wants to believe deep down inside again, you won't admit it to anyone, but deep down inside, you think that you're at least one or two steps above the average line, right? And there's a temporal gap, right? Um, and that's the second barrier of uh, communicating risk. And the temporal gap basically says that um, you want to believe that the future is always rosy. That's why you're here, right, on a Saturday. You think that attending this is going to somehow help you in the future and make your future better. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. And so we always want to believe that the future is a better rosy picture than the, than the present. And we always have some sort of a social gap where we want to distance ourselves from risk. And that's why communicating risk tends to be really challenging. People just don't want to believe it. They don't want to believe that the risk can happen now. They don't want to believe that the risk can happen to them. Well, virtual reality um, gives us tools to close both of these social and temporal gaps. And so this is a video of um, students in my lab creating a photorealistic avatar, so we take, um, this is a pretty outdated uh, software at this point, but the idea is still the same. So we take a few, I guess, uh, dots around the face and basically do a digital face-off and wrap it around the avatar mesh to create our photorealistic avatars. Now, a lot of the companies are already coming up with better, faster ways of doing this. I believe Apple is coming up with a way to sw swivel your iPhone around so that you can do this in, I don't know, a matter of of minutes. Um, so it, it's, it's basically similar to the idea of uh, photogrammetry, but this is an older version of this. So once we create this photorealistic avatar of ourselves or anyone else here, we're able to manipulate it to make it talk, make it frown, make it do anything that we want. Um, the avatar is basically ours. Now, um, once we embed this avatar in a message, that message is no longer about someone else. It's not about a model. It's not about a celebrity. It is a message completely personalized with you embedded into that message. And once we create this avatar, we're also able to show you an accelerated um, progression of time. So this is um, a photorealistic avatar of one of my lab mates back at Stanford, and you are watching him age. Um, into a 65-year-old in a matter of a few seconds. Now, once we have this ability to accelerate time and make your avatar age, now we're able to really play with the concept of showing you future consequences. So not only is the message just about you, I can show you immediately um, what you would look like 30 years down the road or 30 years before something happened, right? It works both ways. Um, we tested this concept with uh, trying to reduce um, the consumption of sugar-added beverages. And so this is an actual health pamphlet from the New York City um, Department of uh, Health. And basically, the pamphlet is telling you if you drink a lot of sugar-added beverages like soda, then you are essentially consuming so many extra um, calories that it's like drinking fat. And so the statistics um, for this uh, pamphlet We'll give you information like if you continue to drink 12 ounce regular cans of Coke every single day for a full year, the excess calories is equivalent to about 10 pounds in fat. So if you continued that to two years, then it would be about 20 pounds of excess calories in fat. So we provided um, students with either this pamphlet alone, or we added a virtual reality experience in addition to this pamphlet to really drive that message home. So we created um, their self avatars and then showed um, these undergraduates what would happen. So that is fat falling onto a digital scale. And as the avatar is drinking soda, she is gaining 20 pounds of fat over two years in time. 
So as you can see, the design of this virtual simulation is really driving all of these really important messages home. It's about you, not someone else. Time is, is, uh, is accelerating, and we're, we're able to show you a 20, 20 pound fatter version of you with 20 pounds of fat on the digital scale. You get the audio, you get the visual. Um, it's a very kind of a um, visceral way of experiencing this future consequence of, of really kind of benign health behaviors. And so um, we ran three series of studies on this um, and found out that the virtual simulation makes the risk seem really personally relevant. And so it's no longer just about any other person. It's about you because you just saw yourself gaining weight over time. Um, and then it seems very temporally imminent because, again, you saw that accelerated future um, happen right in front of your eyes within about 30 seconds. And experiencing the risk firsthand really changes your attitude about the issue. So we see a lot of um, changes in intentions to, intentions to reduce their consumption, and we ask them one week afterwards how much uh, soda and sugar-added beverages they consumed, and uh, one week later, it actually leads to reduction in um, actual consumption. And what's really interesting is that when they um, experience this in virtual simulations, uh, the impact of, on the attitude and behavioral change tends to last longer, whereas uh, the group of students who just read it in a pamphlet tended to forget about it a lot faster and easier over time. And if you think about this, it's a very scalable solution. So um, imagine going to a doctor's office and you always get a stack of pamphlets, right, at the doctor's office. What do you do with the pamphlets? Anyone read them? I do, but I'm weird. I, I read manuals. Um, so if you think about all the pamphlets that you get from the doctor's office and the way that no one ever reads them, this would be a really simple and fast setup in a doctor's office where people get to see the future consequences, and then you have their attention, and that's when the pamphlets go out instead of uh, just handing them the pamphlet and hoping that they'll be engaged with the uh, material. Now, um, here's another concept that we tested in the uh, domain of consumer behaviors in advertising. So in virtual reality, what's really interesting is that you can um, separate form realism with behavioral realism, meaning that I can create an avatar that looks exactly like me, but a third party is able to control that avatar. So when that happens, when does it stop becoming me and when does it start becoming the other person, right? If the avatar looks exactly like me, but someone else is controlling it. We call this a uh, virtual doppelganger. So it's a, it's a representation that looks exactly like you. So it's my doppelganger, but anyone is able to gain control over it. So this presents a really interesting um, scenario. So let's say that I'm going home today, and then I flip on my television. And in a television commercial, I appear, my avatar appears, it looks exactly like me, and now the virtual self on TV is persuading the physical self, me, at home, right? And they're saying, and she's saying, Grace, I know that you like this particular brand. I know because I'm you. Can you say no to yourself? And it turns out that we're really bad at it. If I ask you, do you make a good model? It's really hard for you to say no, that she lies. <laughs> it's really hard. And so the idea we call it is self-endorsing. So let's say that I flip through a magazine. Easily, the same thing can happen, right? That's me, and I am trying to persuade my physical self, here, you, you have never seen this brand, but let me promise you, you like it. So you are endorsing this brand to yourself, and you think that this is uh, something that would happen far off in the future if you think about Facebook, if you think about Google Plus, now that's, that's I, don't, I don't think it's around anymore, um, LinkedIn, all of these social media platforms are taking your profile photos and your profile information to adverti advertise to your friends and also to yourself, and they're experiencing a lot of success. So they know that this stuff works. Um, if you think about the virtual reality realm and how easy it is to create an avatar of yourself, uh, of course, they'll, they'll probably tap into this. It's just a matter of minutes, of, of time. 
So um, we created this simulation where uh, you are sitting across another avatar, and you're sitting here, and you're experiencing this brand, and you're uh, looking at another person across from you, and you're engaging in conversation. This other avatar is wearing a different brand. So the idea is to compare the impact of controlling and identif identifying with your avatar versus looking at someone, right? Because if you engage in conversation, you tend to look at the other person as you are talking to them instead of looking down at yourself, right? That's, that's kind of how naturalistic conversations happen. And so we wanted to compare the impact of looking at someone's brand versus actually wearing it and experiencing the brand and having control over it in virtual reality. And it turns out that self-endorsing of this form is much more impactful than merely looking at someone's brand. And so if you think about it, um, control is important, but it's really strong when control is um, given with self-identification. So if you are sitting there, you're controlling your avatar, it's a lot more high impact than you looking and merely being exposed to another brand. And so if you think about this in terms of virtual reality and advertising, you're able to go into different experiences and um, try out that, that virtual product even without moving anywhere or going anywhere into uh, an actual store. And that has um, a lot of brand impact. And so um, if you think about this, it has a lot of implications for things like shopping at home. And I'll show you a, a quick video of, of how that would look like. And self-endorsing um, is this interesting messaging strategy where uh, you are now a part of the brand because you're, you're a part of the brand's message. And so that gets a lot of people to really kind of think about, um, I guess, me, the self, as an extension of that brand. And it has a lot of um, uh, power in terms of uh, how much it influences your brand preferences. And um, of course, there are ethical concerns. Um, for instance, let's say that my kid is growing up with virtual reality and he sees his own avatar in Disney World playing with Mickey Mouse. Of course he wants to go, right? Um, and back at Stanford, we tested uh, this out with, um, this concept out with four-year-olds and seven-year-olds. And um, we put them in virtual reality, had them swim underwater with orcas named, I don't know, Flippy and something, Freddy and Flippy or something. Um, and then we called them back in one week afterwards and asked the group of four-year-olds and the group of seven-year-olds, did this really happen? And the group of four-year-olds just swore up and down, this really happened. I was there, I swam with them, I touched them, they were my friends, it wasn't my dream, it really happened. To them, it really happened. Because again, you're being surrounded by sensory information. They saw it, they felt it, they heard it. Now, if you go above the age of seven, they're a little bit better at being able to tell apart reality from fantasy and television from advertising. And so they're a little bit better at this. But if you think about the ethical considerations of vulnerable audiences that are younger or older or have various cognitive um, disabilities, then, I mean, we're, we're, we're testing really... Uh, I guess, dangerous waters here. And um, a lot of research needs to go into this before rolling it out. Um, here's the fourth uh, thing, that fourth tip that I wanted to talk about. Um, we find across a lot of experiments that avatar appearance alone can impact the way that you think and behave. And um, I'll give you a few examples of that. So I don't know if you've heard about the Proteus effect. This basically says, and the idea is that when you control an avatar that looks in a particular way, then you tend to merge that avatar self-concept with your own. And because of that, even after you come out into the physical world, your attitudes and behaviors change. So for instance, in a series of experiments, we took male participants and gave half of them tall avatars and the other half short avatars and they had to interact with other people in the virtual world as either tall or short avatars, we took them back out into the physical world and had them negotiate. And regardless of your physical height, if you had a tall avatar, you were much more aggressive in your negotiation tactics versus if you had a short avatar. 
We replicated this using female avatars, uh, gave half of them attractive avatars, uh, or female participants, and then um, gave the other half unattractive avatars, had them interact as attractive or unattractive avatars, took them out into the physical world, put them on an online dating site. And the female participants who had attractive avatars were much more confident in approaching other people in the online dating sites, regardless of their actual um, physical attractiveness. And so we have, and it's not just that, uh, we have a series of, uh, I guess, a, a growing literature on how just controlling an avatar of a certain, certain trait, a certain um, physical trait, can change the way that you behave and the way that you think about yourself in the physical world. And so we wanted to um, not only test these desirable traits like height, like if you're tall or if you're attractive, but we wanted to also see if, uh, what if people controlled um, an avatar with some undesirable trait? And so we turned people into Kim Kardashian. Um, so Kim Kardashian is well known for her narcissi narcissistic traits. And so here you are. So we have my poor program programmer, who is now Kim Kardashian. We put people in the mirror, and we ask them, um, can you step to the right, can you step to the left, uh, do some head movements, bend down the knee, make sure that they know that they're controlling this avatar. And then we had them turn over, and this is the shopping um, part of the experiment. So we asked them, here's a luxury brand, and here's a non-luxury brand. Imagine you're, you're, you know, you're Kim Kardashian now, so shop like she does. Um, and then once you make your selection, throw it into the bin. So there's a Cartier, and then the Timex. So we went through a series of these shopping, um, shopping tasks. What's really interesting is that when it is a negative trait, people don't want to be associated with it. But people who did embody Kim Kardashian as their own avatar, attitudes about Kim Kardashian suddenly increased. So they're like, well, you know, Kim K really isn't that bad. Because I, I was her. But if you ask the participants, are you narcissistic? They're like, no, 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 no. So their state of narcissism dropped significantly lower than when we measured it before they embodied Kim Kardashian. But their attitudes about Kim increased. And so whoever they were in the physical, in the virtual world, they want to think that they're, they're good people. But if that person just happened to have a negative, a negative trait, they don't want to be associated with it. So they'll say something like, well, yeah, I know that Kim K is uh, known, for her, known for her narcissism, but it's not me. Me? No. I'm, I'm not at all narcissistic. And so the Proteus effect may be only applicable for desirable traits and not so much for the undesirable traits. Because when we looked at the selection uh, between the luxury brands and non-luxury brands, it really didn't have a difference. So they really kind of consciously are, I guess, trying to distance themselves from that negative trait um, that Kim K is known for. Um, so be mindful of avatar appearances when you get people to embody a certain avatar. It may, the avatar, the, what it looks like, even if it's a celebrity, may really impact the way that people think and behave in the virtual world and even outside of it. And even simple cues like we've seen color of clothing. So if they wear black versus if they wear white, um, it can really trigger different behaviors and attitudes. Same thing with racial implications. So if you embody a black African American or a white Caucasian, Asian versus, and um, so on and so forth. And these changes transfer into the physical world. It's not lasting, but it can last for a fairly brief uh, period of time. So it won't completely change you into Kim Kardashian, or <laughs> you, it won't completely change your personality, but it may have an impact on um, your decisions for, for quite a while. Um, tip number five, uh, consider interdisciplinary collaborations. And uh, we have several really interesting collaborations that were brought on by kind of unexpected uh, partnerships throughout different colleges on campus. Um, and one of it tends to be, uh, happens to be um, the veterinary medicine school. 
So one of the projects that we're on um, deals with obesity and physical activity. And as you probably know, we're right about here, so super deep, deep red. Oh, wait, no, right here. Yeah, so kind of red. Um, but it's been red for a while, and childhood obesity in particular has been pretty high in Georgia. And what's really interesting about childhood obesity is that uh, kids up until about the age of six are super, super active, right? Like once I put a, I put a Fitbit on him, and he averages 15,000 steps per day. Average. So higher than 15,000 is, is not a surprising thing. I was like, 15,000? Huh? Anyway, so they're super active. But once they hit uh, school age, around the age of uh, seven, they have more sedentary time. So they tend to sit around longer, a lot longer in classrooms. Um, screen time increases. And so they just don't, there's, there's almost a, a precipitous decline, a drop a significant drop in their physical activity patterns. And so somewhere around this age is kind of our window of uh, opportunity to go in with physical activity interventions um, at an earlier rather than a later age. And so that's kind of our, our, our approach to this. We want to get them early. Um, now, we came across a really interesting report from the American Heart Association. And they said um, that dog ownership leads to a host of favorable health indicators like uh, lower cardiovascular diseases, um, more physical activity, lower rates of obesity, so on and so forth, because it turns out that even if you don't exercise, you have to walk your dog. Even if you eat junk food, you feed your pet premium pet food. Isn't that true? I get really expensive uh, stuff for my little dog. Um, so researchers got super excited, and they were like, oh, OK, well, then we can come up with uh, programs, physical activity interventions that involve the family pet. And the results were kind of all over the place, because what they didn't think about is the fact that dogs are not systematic. So they will not say, hey, we went on, thir on a 30-minute walk yesterday, so today let's shoot for 35 minutes, and then the next day we go for 40 minutes. They don't do that, right? And so it was kind of really successful for, or, sorry, for a certain number of trials and then um, a failure for others. And so um, the problem was that we couldn't get the pets to be systematic for us. And so the idea was to pull together uh, different, I guess, teams from the campus. So Vet Med was one. Um, I was from communication. We had engineering. We had extension services. And we built a virtual dog that could um, maintain the, the favorable and beneficial relationship between the pet and the human, but also be programmatic and systematic in their approach to physical activity interventions. So here's the interaction cycle. We gave every child a Fitbit, and they um, met with a virtual dog in a kiosk that we built for them. And the virtual dog will say, what's your physical activity goal for the day? They set it, and the virtual dog says, all right, go away and go exercise, because I don't want you to exercise in front of the screen. And the child leaves the kiosk to engage in physical activity. So when the child feels that he or she has met the goal for the day, comes back, then the kiosk will automatically download the data from the Fitbit, and the virtual dog will either congratulate the kid for meeting the goal or tell the kid, oh, you're missing 10 minutes. Now, when the goal has been met, the child gets to interact with the dog by uh, teaching it different tricks. So here's a quick video of that.
So you can imagine um, how the kids would have reacted to a dog like this. Um, so we went into um, a 4-H camp nearby and uh, recruited about 60 kids. We gave half of them the virtual dog that you just saw, and then the other half received a computer system that would still allow them to set and meet physical activity goals and receive verbal feedback. It just didn't have the virtual dog. We asked them to exercise for three days, so 72 hours. And um, it was really surprising because it was a summer camp and we thought that we would hit what we call the ceiling effect, meaning that they're exercising so much already that the treatment effect really doesn't show a difference between the control. And um, what we found out was that the children with the virtual pet exercise 1.09 hours more than the children with, uh, ah, with the control group. And what we find is really interesting in that um, so the virtual pet condition leads to self-efficacy, which means that they now feel confident that they can meet and, um, or set and meet physical activity goals. And that's when they start believing that physical activity is good for them, and that leads to more exercising behavior. If you flip these two variables around, it no longer works, meaning it doesn't really matter how much, how much you tell the kids physical activity is good for you, unless they believe that they can set and meet physical activity goals. And so they need to believe in themselves first before they believe that physical activity is good for them. Um, so right now, we are expanding this um, and going into 24 after-school programs um, with the YMCA of Metropolitan Atlanta. And we were able to secure a um, $3.5 million grant from the National Institutes of Health. And we're trying to involve also not just the children, but also parents into this, where parents are receiving real-time notifications as a result of their children's interaction with the kiosk. And they're able to discuss and communicate physical activity um, goals with their kids through that kiosk as sort of a main source of communication. And so we'll, we'll see. We're, really, um, we're currently running this study, and we're really looking forward to the data. Now, um, I think this is the last one. Do I have time? Yeah. OK, so the last tip is that the human brain is super flexible. It's a lot more flexible than you, than you think. And so your imagination is the limit in terms of where you can go with virtual reality. So we always focus on trying to make virtual reality just like reality. But it actually turns out that the human brain is able to take a lot more than that and really push the boundaries in terms of imagination. Um, I don't know if you've all heard the rubber hand illusion. Yeah? OK, so here's a quick video of what that is.
So what's really interesting is that we're able to replicate this in virtual reality. So people have shown that um, if you take a virtual hand and um, you ask the participant to move uh, their physical hand along with the virtual hand, and they do the same thing, they smash it with a hammer, then they flinch. They've done the same thing where um, they will put an avatar, and you, you're controlling that avatar, and they start poking the avatar with a stick, or they, they poke your, your, um, your back, or they'll stroke your arm. And then once that visual stimulus has overridden the tactile stimulus so that you feel like the avatar is actually your own body, then they slap the avatar and people flinch. They've also done a really interesting um, experiment where they give everyone avatar tails and they'll ask people to start maneuvering their tail with a controller. And they're doing various tasks so that at a certain point, that visual stimulus makes them believe that the tail is really a part of them, right, an extra limb. And then they set the tail on fire. <laughs> and it really makes you uncomfortable. And we call this homuncular flexibility. So there's an area in your brain called the homunculus. And it's able to really flexibly um, adopt different limbs. And that's how people are able to adopt pros prosthetics really quickly. And so we've given people um, up to eight limbs. We call it the human avatar or the hu human lobster. And um, when we give you eight limbs, so four legs and four arms, people learn how to use it in a matter of minutes as if they were born with it. So your brain is really flexible in the concept of um, accepting what your body looks like and what it's supposed to do. And so we wanted to extend this into, can you become an animal and really believe that you've become that animal? So can we get you to transfer into the body of an animal? The reason being, um, we wanted to test your environmental consciousness and your environmental behavior and attitudes. It's just that you've never been an animal, so you don't really know what environmental damage truly feels like. You know how like, uh, other people have said things like, um, imagine that you're, you're a duck in an oil spill. Well, you weren't the duck, so how would you know, right? And so we wanted to see if you can become a shorthorn cow who is being um, sent to the slaughterhouse. And imagine yourself in that situation. Or what if you're a piece of coral in an ocean being acidified, right? Ocean acidification is a real um, environmental threat, but you're not a piece of coral, so you really don't know what it feels like. So we turned you into either a cow or a piece of coral to try to get you to feel what environmental damage feels like. This is a participant who has become a cow. So we asked the participant um, to eat hay in a trough, or hay, hay thing, and um, drink water. And we start poking the virtual cow with a cattle prod. And um, we didn't get to poke the participant with the cattle prod. But we poked this participant with a stick. And so again, if you have the visual cue of the cattle prod and you feel the tactile cue happen simultaneously, then that synchronous experience gets you to come to a state where you are now transferred into the body of this cow, and you believe that the body of this cow is actually you. So whatever happens to the cow happens to you. You feel like it's real. We did the same thing with the piece of coral. So um, there's a scene where the piece of coral is being hit by a fishing net, and we poke the participant with an actual stick. Again, there comes to a point where you start realizing that you are now this piece of coral, and when the ocean acidification um, progresses to a point where all of your marine buddies are dying, fish are dying, clams are dying, shrimp are dying, um, then your uh, coral body becomes calcified and your limbs fall off. And when that happens, people feel very uncomfortable, as if your limbs were falling off. And so here's a, here's a quick uh, video of that. So that's when you get poked. So that's calcified coral. That was the sound of your limbs falling off. And people visibly flinch when that happens. And you see your arm floating in the water, and it's just not very pleasant. What we find is that not only does this lead to people believing 
that um, they've now become this piece of coral and they're really underwater, um, they now become much more involved in the environmental issue than they were before. So now they're, they're interested in learning much more about it. So if you have any information that you, you were meaning to send to these people, that would be a perfect time. Um, and not only that, this the effect of this experience lasts um, for up to 24 hours. It could be longer. We just measured uh, one day after they were in this experience. Um, and what they remember is a lot more vivid than what they saw, let's say, on a video or on a pam pamphlet and so on and so forth. And so the effects last a lot longer. Now, in terms of, well, what are we going to expect in the future? Um, now that the uh, Oculus Quest is coming, they're also talking about an all-in-one um, Oculus version where it's completely wireless and tetherless and it's actually cheaper, um, so you don't have to purchase a separate computer for it. So virtual reality devices are now becoming more accessible and um, easier to use. Um, they're developing more programs where it's becoming plug and play. And so now the... Um, the, I guess the idea of um, everyone using virtual reality, like the way that they use their phones, um, is becoming much more feasible. And what we know from all of these studies is that uh, the virtual experiences tend to be superior to text or 2D photos or videos. They last longer. Um, and you can think about different ways that they can assist policy and decision making in a variety of cases in health and consumer um, behaviors or environmental behaviors. Um, so when we talk about ubiquitous VR, uh, we can have this meeting right here in social VR without having to travel, right? I could have meet, met all of you through an avatar and I've actually given a talk on VR in VR, which is very meta. So that could be very feasible. Um, however, we do have to really think about the unintended effects of VR. Um, ethical consideration, vulnerable audiences. Are we ready for a lot of the things that VR has, uh, I guess, in, in stock? Uh, what's capable in VR doesn't necessarily mean that we are ready for it. And so um, what about things like uh, identity theft is a completely new meaning in virtual reality, right? If someone created an avatar exactly like me and use it to advertise whatever, pornography or something that I don't want to be used for advertising, uh, where's that lack of trust, right? How are we going to deal with regulations and legislature related to these levels of high technology? Are we ready for all of that? So they all need to be considered. Um, but if you remember, way, 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 way back when phones were just becoming a thing, mobile phones, right? Remember this, this little guy? When it used to be you had to carry a briefcase because you had to send satellite signals for your phone, and then it progressed into like these things, Blackberries, the Motorola. I don't know what this brick is. <laughs> so mobile phones actually took a good 10, 15 years before they were actually even considered something that everyone had. And so if you give virtual reality a little bit of time, um, I think we'll, we'll eventually get there, probably not at the metaverse that you see in the, in the movies, but a lot more advanced than we currently have right now, where we're currently right now, we're tethered to a lot of things and we're um, working with very clunky hardware. But I think virtual reality is slowly getting to the point where it can be feasible um, to use as an everyday communication tool. And that's it for me. If you have any questions, I would uh, love to address them.